Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being with us again. This week, we dedicate a whole session to Definitive Technology. Joining us today are our very own top guys at Definitive Technology. We have Matt Alliance, our Chief Engineer for Definitive Technology based out of the engineering facility in Baltimore in East Coast. And we have Michael Greco, our Senior Director of Category Management Loudspeakers, also from Sound United, who is based in the West Coast in Vista, California. Welcome, gentlemen. I'm happy that you are joining us again today, and thanks for your time. I am Frederick. I am joining you from Hong Kong, and both Phil and Jim will be co-hosting today. So I'm handing it, handing the floor to you guys. Matt, let's talk about the definitive experience. What is that all about? <clears throat> the definitive experience is is a listening experience that really envelops you, draws you in, and creates that emotional connection to what you're listening to. And there, there are 10 octaves in, in the musical spectrum from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. It is very difficult, physics being what it is, it's very difficult to truly reproduce deep bass and do it in an accurate way. So it's something we strive for all the time uh, at Definitive. The next thing I would talk about is dynamic range. You know, <clears throat> from the, from the softest softs to the loudest louds, our ear brain system has a tremendous ability to resolve dynamic range. That's why the decibel scale is, is actually logarithmic because we have such wide dynamic range. The other thing uh, that I think is, is very unique, and Jim talked about the fact that <clears throat> Definitive takes a different approach and our bipolar loudspeakers takes a different approach to the sound field itself. We want to create an incredibly immersive sound field where you feel like your room disappears and all you hear is the ambient information that is in the recording. So <clears throat> that is that is key to the definitive experience and, and create a more immersive uh, sound field than I think, uh, I think most other offerings that are out there. The last piece of the definitive experience to me is actually visual, it's not auditory. It's that we always endeavor to design a loudspeaker which visually is worthy of how beautiful the speaker sounds. I like to say it's it's easy to design a loudspeaker that's maybe ugly. It's harder to make a beautiful loudspeaker that actually sounds uh, amazing. What are some of the technologies that we use to bring this obsession that you have to life? And you you it's obsession in a good way, not in a negative way, Matt. As a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you have an no. obsession for, for Definitive and it shows. So what are some of the technologies that you use? So definitely, I, I love our, our phrase, what obsession sounds like. I think all of us in the Definitive team are, are very passionate about what we do and, and it does border on, on, on obsession. So anytime you're designing a loudspeaker, uh, you always have to start off with the ingredients and the ingredients are going to affect uh, the meal that you're creating. Now, obviously, everything that we design for Definitive, you'll see, you know, the near ubiquitous use of the same key technologies in, in the aluminum dome tweeter, uh, the BDSS driver technology. It's in our outdoor speakers, passive radiators in an outdoor speaker. That's crazy. Nobody else does that, base radiators. So no, every product that we design is always about providing that Definitive experience right, wherever the application is. Um, I think we're going to switch gears a little bit if, if and move on to the bipolar line. Uh, Matt, let's talk about how did that bipolar line evolve over time and why? Okay. So the going back to Jim, your, your original description and the vision for the brand, the idea of let's take some of the magic of an electrostatic speaker and improve upon it and make it more accessible. Well, what's a dipole? A dipole is a flat planar loudspeaker that radiates sound in both directions, to the front and to the back. Now, that radiation pattern is actually a dipole. So both of the, the front and the back move together, which makes it very difficult to create bass, makes it challenging uh, to place them in a room. What we do at Definitive is a very unique approach in that we have transducers on both the front baffle and the back baffle. We drive them so that they're both energizing the room simultaneously. The net effect is we get this huge sound stage, but we get excellent integration to the bass and the lower mids, 
easier to place in the room. But remember what I talked about is creating a soundstage where your room disappears and what you hear is the ambience in the recording. So that's, that's the fundamental element of bipolar technology. And we have had several generations of, of the bipolar line, starting off with the original BP-10, and that was a, a six and a half inch driver and a tweeter on the front, six and a half inch driver and tweeter on the back. That was, that was the entire package. And it was, it was truly a revolutionary speaker uh, for its day, but we have, we have continued to evolve the design approach. So after the BP, the first thing we went to then was what we called the tower speakers. And if you look at this really cool picture here, you see that you can see the arrays. In this case, we have two drivers on the front and a tweeter, two drivers on the back and a tweeter, but then this massive driver. So we incorporated a powered subwoofer into this cabinet and we amplified it. And this is really, to me, the quintessential uh, definitive bipolar tower configuration that we still use today. What it gives you is that enormous sound field but it gives you that deep bass and it does so in a mind-blowingly sexy slim tower. Uh, and it gives us that dynamic range, that huge sound feel. And so it's, it's an experience that's unlike any other loudspeaker. And it's all put together in a package. While it's, a, it's not a small speaker, uh, it's amazing how much sound we get out of these devices. Uh, and so it's, it's, if you haven't heard of a bipolar loudspeaker, go out and do it today because it's an experience unlike any others. Uh, and so that went back 2000 series, 7000 series. About 10 years ago, we worked on the 8000 series. And we, what we did with the 8000 series is we began to evolve the dispersion pattern of the loudspeakers. Remember I talked about before, was same number of transducers on the back, same number of transducers on the front. With the 8000 series, we were mindful of changes uh, in, in the home theater world in that the original Bipolar speakers were designed when televisions were those massive pioneer elite rear projection TVs that were like very, very deep. Um, and when you put those speakers next to them, they looked beautiful and it was a, a very good match, but television technology continued to evolve. And in the 8000 series, we were then in the time of say plasma televisions, televisions were getting mounted on the wall and we wanted to create a loudspeaker in the next generation of BPs and once again, was easy to integrate into your home. And so we changed the dispersion pattern. We, we went to what we call our forward focused bipolar array. And in that sense, what we did is we put more energy coming out the front, right? And the 8,000 series you see in this great image. So we have a, basically a, a more sound output coming out the front and less coming out the back. And what that did is it made it easier to place into the room, easier to place a bit closer to the rear wall and it, it also improved the imaging. So you still got this massive sound field, but it improved uh, the accuracy of the imaging across the front. So that was a, a major enhancement for the 8000 series. Today, of course, the expression of BP is our 9000 series, and we continued to refine uh, that series. But one of the key differences, one of the improvements I really wanted to make with the 9000 series was when you have a, a powered subwoofer that's built in, there are tremendous benefits to the, the powered subwoofer for being built in. If you think about it, you've probably spent time trying to get your subwoofer over in the corner, trying to blend well to your, your, your floor standing speaker. We do all that work for you in the BP series. You, you, you are always sure that you're getting the right blending between the subwoofer and the bipolar array. And that also uh, means that when you're energizing the room, if you have, two loudspeakers for your left and right, or even better, multiple towers, um, you're getting multiple subwoofers into the room. So not only does the powered tower get you better integration between the base and the mid-range, it gets you better coupling and smoother dis distribution of low frequency energy through the use of multiple subwoofers. And in the BP9000 series, we took that a little bit further and we created our intelligent base control. So it doesn't matter where you have the level set on your subwoofer. We, we change with every change of that knob, the frequency response of the subwoofer amplifier is tailored to make sure that you have perfect blending between the subwoofer and the bipolar array. And that's our intelligent base control. 
you've probably heard like muddy or chesty sounds coming out of, of systems with powered subwoofers. At Definitive, we take care of all that. And oh, by the way, the subwoofer is invisible because it's built into these towers. Because what you see is there's a tremendous amount of acoustic volume in these tower loudspeakers. We have separate enclosures for the bipolar array, and then you have a tremendous amount of acoustic volume in there for the subwoofers. So these subwoofers, right, play incredibly deep, they have an incredible dynamic range and perfect blending. So it, it, that's a tremendous enhancement. The last thing I wanna say about the 9000 series is we have in the 98, our flagship, we have an integrated up-firing Atmos speaker. And once again, we have, because it's all built together, we have a uh, perfect blending between the two uh, and you can get the elevation experience uh, without having to cut holes in your ceiling. And same linear waveguide, BDSS driver. Uh, and in, in this case, we've actually shaped the, uh, the tweeter waveguide in such a way uh, to make the, the sound actually sound like it's coming from the ceiling. It's, 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 a, it, it's an amazing experience. The other thing, and maybe I'll let Michael talk about this, uh, is that's the 9080 where the elevation speaker is built in. The other models all support uh, a separate uh, up-firing module. And the design for this just blew my mind when, when, when the designer brought it to me the first time. It's just so cool. So maybe I'll let Michael talk about that. Yeah, so when you look at the, the, you look at the line, right, one of the things you'll notice is that um, they all basically have the same width when you're looking on the baffle and the same depth. And that was done intentionally. And that what that allows us to do is to build in this uh, elevation module or height module and so because you've seen these before right so you've seen other speakers and what do they do they take something and they just stick it on the top and you've got kind of a ponytail of cables coming out the back but again think about what obsession sounds like think about attention to detail so what the engineering team did was first of all we had to design the speakers because we didn't want to have to have separate tops that would be a retail nightmare but they also wanted to make it so that it wasn't kind of a lego set that you had to kind of put together you wanted it to seamlessly integrate so if you look at that top panel um uh, where actually we don't i don't know if we have a picture on it, but there is a large piece of extruded aluminum it's brushed aluminum on the top panel and when that pops off and what happens is that it reveals this custom connector. So there you go, in this picture. So you see on the left side, upper side, this is what the speaker looks like without the height module built in. And what happens is you just, it's on a little teeter-totter. You press one end and that thick piece of aluminum comes off. And what it reveals below it is where the connector is. And then you have this, the, the elevation module, which you can see on the right now affixed to the top of the speaker, and it just literally clicks in. And what happens is, is all the cabling routes through the internals of the speaker, so you don't have anything hanging off. So if you go back to Definitive, we talked about, we needs to look beautiful, needs to sound amazing, right? So this is all going back to those aspects of, um, the touch points are premium, it looks premium, you don't have a bunch of wires hanging off the back, and it all just, it it, neat, it seamlessly fits together. And when you look at the, the line of speakers, you'll, because they all have the same width and same depth, it gives it a very uniform uh, uh, feel to it. So it, it naturally fits in any home. It looks very, it looks very, very modern. Um, it's very unusual. Normally when you look at a speaker line from any brand um, out there, uh, the small tower is, has a different uh, you know, uh, profile than the medium, than the large tower. And this makes these things all very, uh, uh, very unique. And this is also part of that Bauhaus design concept. If you go back to the back panel, um, that the back panel shot where you were doing the intelligent bass control, you had a, uh, you can actually see the back panel of the uh, floor standing speaker. What you'll notice is there's two sets of binding posts. And it's not because it's by wiring and by amping, it's the top set of binding posts is for the height module. And that lower set of binding posts is for the actual um, mid-range drivers. And it's basically everything but the height module. And so again, it's very clean, very simple, very easy to set up, but it's, um, it's all very tightly integrated. And that's that attention to detail that we were talking about. And I could ask Jim Crowley about the LFE on the back, but yeah. So two things, and then we have Frederick read the question about the subwoofer connection, because that's going to send Jim right down the rabbit hole. And um, but the first thing is we talk about powerful bass from a small, even though that cabin has a lot of volume in it, 
it's still a lot smaller than what you would normally have to use if you were using trying to generate that type of base without having to have powered subwoofers. So Mike, Michael and I just did a, a, uh, a comparison against a competitive speaker that was significantly, that appeared significantly larger in the room, but, but when you played it against the competitive, um, the comparative um, definitive, it was a base beatdown. You would definitely, it was like, it, it was the, the difference in low end frequency impact was absolutely stunning. And we were doing it with like that Spotify test tone you want to talk about that, Mike? That was that was a great demonstration about that we did oh, there. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things we'll do is we'll obviously take loudspeakers and um, and we'll just we, we won't do this like a normal human being, right? So what we'll do is we'll play <laughs> test out. Why? Because we can. So we'll do pink noise and other things. But the other thing we'll do is we'll play single uh, frequency, low frequency tones, such as a 30 hertz tone, 40 hertz tone, and so forth. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand how that loudspeaker is handling that particular uh, frequency. And so when we were doing this competitor, which was actually uh, slightly more expensive, larger, um, you know, when we played a 40 hertz tone, you heard the 40 hertz tone, it was very clear, it was very, um, it was, there was no, no, no port noise because there's no ports on these things. Um, and then when you did that with the competitor, it was significantly less. I mean, yes. not just not like, oh, you have to have dog's ears to hear the difference. It was significantly less. And so <laughs> it was. So, again, when we talk about these things, it's very hard to describe it because every speaker manufacturer says my speakers are the best. I sound amazing. I do amazing things. And there but the, the, the problem is it's all relative. And so until you actually can experience it and be it in your own home with your own equipment, it's very difficult to tell. And so that's why when people always ask me, what should I go buy? I, I give them broad recommendations, but then I say, go listen, because your tastes are going to be different and your house is going to be different and your electronics will be different. But um, in this instance, in the same house with the same electronics, with the same source, it was it was demonstrably different. And that's part of that BP experience where you have a smaller form factor tower it's playing deeper, tighter bass. Um, and in this instance, it was actually less expensive. So, um, you know, it, that, it, there's a lot going into these speakers. Um, we had a converse, we had a question about weight, and it's like, when you realize you have subwoofers built in <laughs> to an all wood cabinet, right? It's like, all of a sudden, it, there's a reason these things weigh 60, 70, 80, 100 pounds, that type of thing. Michael, the One th other thing I wanna mention about our bipolar loudspeakers is because you have amplification built in, they're very easy to drive uh, for your audio video receiver. You point. have, uh, they, they, you get more effective power out of your receiver because there's less current draw due to the amplification. So it, it, it creates that, that whole uh, ease of fulfilling a dynamic range. So that's an important, important characteristic of the bipolar and the powered subwoofer. So Frederick, why don't you read a question about integrating that integrating um, home theater and subwoofer outputs like pre-outs to a pair of um, of BP towers, and then we can let Jim go off with his battle flag. <laughs> exactly. So this is a question from Balaji, Balaji Ramachandran. He's asking, since the BP9000 series has an active subwoofer building the towers, how do you pass the signal to the four towers, knowing that the AVR only has two pre-outs for the subwoofer? Also, in case you have two towers and separate subwoofers, how do you utilize the active subwoofers in the towers? Thank you for the great question. <laughs> Thanks for teeing me up. I appreciate that. So in that picture that you see on the screen there, there's a little yellow jack on the back and it says LFE input. Don't ever, ever, ever use that, ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> it shouldn't be there. It should not be there. You do not want to take a separate LFE signal and feed it into a speaker that Matt has blood, sweat, and tears into the design of this speaker to make sure that that woofer perfectly blends with the speaker. And it does. It is perfectly blended. You can't get it better. And if you take that away and put it into your preamp, your AV surround preamp, your AVR, it doesn't matter. You're taking away that blending that there have literally been 
tens and tens and hundreds of hours spent perfecting and just eliminating it. Don't do it. Matt, what do you think? Should they do that or not so much? Yeah, it's kind of like designing your own outboard crossover, saying, oh, I can do better than the engineers at Definitive. Uh, the, the, uh, as an engineer, I will use the phrase, sometimes there, there are decisions that are made by people more from the marketing side who want to have check boxes on things. So, Jim, every time you talk about the whole, like, just pretend the LFE jack is not there, it just makes my heart sing. So don't do it. Plug it. Your, use your speaker wire connection. Set the, uh, in, in your AVR, go to a large speaker setting, and that's the way you're going to get the best sound and the best integrated performance. Yes. So, Jim, why don't you talk about, we do these big, large systems at, um, at these trade shows. So, say, for example, we're doing a 7.1.6 with six um, 9080 towers, and we normally bring four SuperCube 8000s. How do you connect that, and what's the best way to optimize something even that elaborate in, in, a, in a room? And, of course, Phil, we do that because we can Right? Exactly. I mean, pallets of speakers. But, yeah. <laughs> um, because I'm a little damaged. Let's just say I'm a little damaged. But what you do is you use the LFE outputs to feed the subwoofers. Do you need additional subwoofers? It depends. It depends on the amount of bass you want, the size of your room, how loud you want to listen. Mm -hmm. Frankly, uh, if you have four bp 9000 towers in a room just four of them front and back and you don't use an outboard sub for the majority of people you will get plenty of bass <laughs> plenty well, let's talk about bass. that how, how many well, what are the size of the woofers and the passive and the passive radiators or, or base radiators on a pair of 9080s and how many watts um, are utilized to drive those matt your turn so the, the towers, we step in the small, uh, in the 9040, you have eight inch, then you go up to 10 inch, then you go up to 12 inch. Yes. And then the passive radiators are the same size. Michael, did I get that right? Sometimes I get these yeah. things wrong. Yeah, you got it perfect, man. And, how, and what's the wattage of the amplifier? Uh, 450 watts. So you're looking big... at, yeah. So this is the equivalent of four <laughs> 12 inch powered subwoofers, and each powered subwoofer has two base radiators. That is in that is an amazing amount of bass. Okay, so a lot of times the reason why we bring them is we're doing demonstrations for how many people, Jim. Sometimes twenty or thirty people, and it's amazing when you put fifty people in a room. The amount of flesh soaks up bass. We have fifty bass traps in there, plus the rooms are massive and the ceilings are like eighteen feet high. So yes, uh, Jim wants to go straight overkill. Um, in the rooms, and then we do stuff like he did a, a demonstration at CES a few years ago with space shuttle launches um, that was IMAX enhanced material, and it was absolutely epic, the amount of dynamic range that was in that room. But that's what you could never get that kind of output from just, just about anything else that's in existence with, with just um, seven speakers and four additional subwoofers. And it's, it, it works well. And yes, you use Y cables mm -hmm. if you're going to do more than two subwoofers and pair them based on location mm -hmm. is the best way to do it. So if you have, like we typically do two in the front and two in the back, because that's just mm -hmm. the simplest mm -hmm. thing to do, you pair the two in the front and then you use a Y cable to pair the two in the back. And then mm -hmm. Odyssey looks at those as a single unit. And Jeff has said, acoustically they are a single unit basically yeah. Yeah. so that works out really really well mm -hmm. um at home i have a an additional woofer along with my bp 9060s but when i listen to music i just use the 9060s that's all i use mm -hmm. and i think they sound terrific if yeah. matt would you mind if we circled back to something there are there were a couple things that that you said or that you didn't say maybe but it got me to thinking, and I want you to talk about it. Michael was talking about how we made the speakers, the 20s, the BP90-20s, and 40s and 60s, all the same width and all the same depth, right? So that the topper, the A90 module, would fit on all three or all of those models because you don't want to have 
you know, again, a retail nightmare. That sounds like a heck of an engineering feat to me, Matt. How big a challenge was that? Well, so it was, frankly, it's the kind of challenge we often get uh, from, from the design team. And uh, they're saying, well, we want it to look this way. So we had to actually engineer all the acoustic volumes and all of the blending of the bipolar arrays individually to each one of those. So it was definitely a design challenge. Uh, and then all the voicing was specific to it. So it, it was definitely a challenge. But I have to say that the, these are the kind of challenges that, that we thrive on at Definitive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it all goes back to that same thing. We want to make a beautiful speaker. But mm -hmm. all three of those speakers are optimized, even though we had to have the same width and depth. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you do that. So when you look at that picture, like that looks extraordinarily beautiful. It's not like, oh, let me pop this cardboard box on top of this other box like you often see with, with elevation speakers. So Now there's one that's a little deeper. And uh, <laughs> but guess what? The one that's a little deeper because it, ha it has the um, elevation uh, height speaker actually built directly into it. So <laughs> so in any other one that does not have the elevation speaker built in, there's one um, module that fits them all. Um, now, somebody asked, um, since we're talking about this, we still want to, the, um, some, um, they actually still asked about the LFE input. The reason, I'm sure um, next year, Matt will pop, or next time we build one of these, Matt will probably say, no more. But it's almost just like a, a reminder. Maybe it's just a reminder that there's a powered, uh, a powered um, subwoofer built into the unit or actually base system built in. Um, but, yeah, it's not really. You should you should not use it ever, 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 ever. It's a vestigial um, organ that we've evolved past. Exactly. So can you talk? I mean, because because as you because as you turn the bait the volume up, Matt, what happens to the, the that's the big thing is what happens to the slope as you turn it up because that's the difference and why um you want to let the you want to let the the system do it instead of um, you trying to do it with your receiver as you turn the knob, the base volume knob up on the back of the of the, of the speaker. It's not what, even what the slope. So essentially, you know, every step, right? So the the, the volume knob is actually, you know, a, a discrete step attenuator, and at each of those increments, uh, we have a unique filter shaping to blend the subwoofer at that click, right? to the bipolar array and you click it up again, it's yet a unique uh, filter frequency response for that. So it's not just a slope, it's that mm -hmm. each freaking position on the volume has its own <laughs> optimized equalization and you just can't get that out of your generic, you know, uh, base management in an AVR. So, so Jim, he does a demo and maybe he got it from you, Matt, using Michael Jackson. Can you talk about that demo, Jim, that you do to prove this point? Cause it's pretty powerful. I I literally stole that from Matt Lyons, um, <laughs> literally, because I heard him do that demo, and it was so powerful, and it drove home the point so well that I'm like, I don't need to change it. This works perfectly, and when you have something that works perfectly, there's no reason to change it, especially when it's a Michael Jackson track that everybody has heard multiple, multiple times. So everybody's very familiar with it. Matt, do you remember that demo? Well, I think what I like to, to share about that is like the character of his voice never changes, mm -hmm. right? No matter where the volume setting is. And that's that's the, the smart part of the intelligent bass control. That's what we wanted to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. Don't mess with the other frequencies, right? Keep the mid rates and, and keep that natural sounding and then just give the user the ability to adjust the bass level without screwing uh, screwing up the rest of the speaker. You can't do that with with separate subwoofers. Yes, and you could try that yourself. Take a um, a male singer, Michael, it's a thing, what's the, it's, what's the track? Um, the way you make you know, me feel. The way you make me feel by Michael Jackson is the one we use, but take a track with a male singer if you have a system that runs subwoofers while you play music and while the singer is playing, crank the sub all the way up and all the way down and see if it affects the, the, uh, the, the, the male singer's voice. And that is because it's, it's one curve, one slope, one, um, 
Um, all, all the things that Matt's suggesting, your subwoofer is not, your LFE is not by just turning up the sub levels on your, it doesn't make these adjustments. So the best base is always gonna be let a BP tower do its, set it to large, send all the base to it and let it figure out what's the best way to, um, to cross over the woofers or adjust, to blend the woofer system to the, uh, the mid range and, and, um, and high frequencies. And it's not just the voice, it's all the instruments, it's the keyboards, it's the guitars. Mm -hmm. It's staggering. Mm -hmm. All that happens when you turn that knob is that you get more bass. Mm -hmm. which is what you want, right? You don't want, boom, you just want more bass. And it always stays musical. And I think, Matt, one of the ter terms you used is round. The bass mm -hmm. stays very round. So you exactly. can't, you can't, literally, you can't make this speaker sound bad with too much bass, exactly. which is not the case with a separate sub. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. I'm, I'm adamant, don't ever use that LFE jack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you call it? A vestigial LFE <laughs> jack? <laughs> like that is big words. Oh, don't need it. That is fantastic. Okay. If I can Let's... remember that big word from the big brains, <laughs> I will absolutely use it again. Yeah. And one of the other things that I want to point out, Matt, that you said, and when they you talked about, Michael goes, yeah, we want that that A90 module to fit on the top or whatever we're going to call it. And uh, they got to be the same footprint and uh, we want it to like look seamless and uh, all of these other things. And, and Matt, what you said, and I wrote it down because I think this is so important. You, you said solving problems in an elegant way. Mm -hmm. And that's one of your key tenants for definitive, right? It's not part of the brand, but it is because of well, what your obsession it, really it, it, it's it's about i mean this to me goes the whole way back to when michael talks about the unboxing experience the definitive experience starts when you open up that cardboard box and the emotional connection we want to make to you is that this is a precision engineered piece that is just everything that we do is 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 to excite and evolve the emotional experience with the product so everything has to be that level of, of, of precision and that level of, we care so much about what we do and we think about every step. And so, I, I, the, Jim, you had, a, you had a picture of the, the center channel up there. Um, and one thing I don't think I talked about is, so this is a real challenge. Obviously we need a center channel speaker. It has to have a smaller footprint. Uh, and so how do you create a center channel that has the same dynamic range and low frequency extension as these, you know, mega machines that are our, our, our towers. And so we do something very unique and we apply the same uh, engineering approach of building a powered subwoofer into our center channels so that for the largest systems, uh, we have the dynamic range in the center channel and you're not compromising that. So it's just another case of, well, what, what problem are we trying to solve? We need to have a center channel. It can't be larger than this. And so we need to then spend more of our, 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 our dollars in designing this product and making sure that we maintain the dynamic range uh, of the system itself. Thanks, Matt. Now, now Michael, the reason why we brought Michael and um, Matt here is because you, we want to give you the product development side and the um and the engineering side so and like i said there's a um there's what what michael's team when it comes to design and marketing and merchandising needs and then there's what what the sound that matt is trying to achieve so michael can you talk a little bit about that balance between the the um price points and design and and all that stuff because we've talked about that trying to find that balance before um, I thought you do a pretty good job of explaining that. Yeah, I mean, there there's always trade-offs, there's always compromises, right? Um, um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to deliver on that definitive experience um, with the fewest amounts of compromises, but we're also trying to achieve a specific price point, right? Because we talk about this where, yeah, if I had unlimited dollars, unlimited time, unlimited engineering resources, yes, I could keep 
building stuff forever and it will be very expensive might be very large might not be too practical so again everything we do is kind of also within kind of those constraints of i need to make something that somebody can afford they can fit in their home and at the same time it looks amazing and sounds amazing and so there always are these these kind of trade-offs. And so, but one of the things that we do, even when we do have these compromises, is that we want to make sure we're true to the definitive experience. So, you know, that's why you don't find plastic parts on the, you know, we got rid of all the plastic parts when we went from BP 8000 to BP 9000. Um, it's it's real aluminum, they're real premium touch points. Um, we don't compromise on the out-of-box experience because Matt talked about this, right? Your experience starts at the retail shop when you get that first demo and you go, wow, I want these. And then you get them home and it continues from there. And that's why that out-of-box experience is so important. And then you set it up the first time and you get it in your room, you play that first piece of music or that first movie and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And then, of course, what you do, what do you do? You start tweaking it, right? You start moving it around to kind of make sure you get this, what you want to fit your room. But it, it's it's all about delivering on the experience, given kind of the 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 economic and retail parameters that we have to work within. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a balance. And that's where um, what that does that tension between kind of trying to build something that looks amazing and sounds amazing but works within these economic and retail realities is that causes us to be more creative and more thoughtful in what we do and we actually spend more time trying to solve these problems elegantly as we talk about right so that we don't just can't throw money at the problem and um, we don't just want to say oh we're going to forget about it we're going to compromise and not live up to the dt standard so what it does is it forces everybody to be more thoughtful and more critical in their thinking to deliver on something such as the bp9000 or the demand series you can build a full complement or full system so whether you're looking at center channels um surrounds as well as um as well as the height enabled pieces that work on each one. And of course, um, if you wanna utilize actual um, speakers in your ceiling, um, Matt, which which ones do you recommend? You Because you, I know that becomes a common question about someone who, instead of using the um, A90s, they wanna use something in the ceiling. Um, what would you I recommend? I recommend the, the DI in wall speakers. Uh, so the DI in wall speakers have the same BDSS technology, the same aluminum dome technology, so use that if you're going with in ceilings uh, with the BP 9000. Phil, on this slide, it says Dolby Atmos and DTSX. Um, these also are um, approved for IMAX. Um, IMAX enhanced. So yeah, so this is a point of reference if somebody exactly. was asking. Exactly. That's the ultimate. We all we like to say, I, I think um, that this, if you're looking for the ultimate home theater speaker, um, this is it. When you talk about dynamics, um, bass, um, the, the how well the height speakers integrate into the um, into the speaker itself. It's it's the ultimate when it comes to if you're looking for a home theater experience. Not only is it a great music speaker, but as a home theater spe um, speaker, it just completely walks away from anything um, in the market. The sound staging, all of that stuff, just makes the speaker awesome for that experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Before we uh, move along, I just want to find out: Do we have any more questions, Frederick? about the BP-9000 line before oh, we yes. uh, change topics a little bit? Yes, we do. We have a couple. We have one from our frequent flyer, Gary, Gary Katzenellenbogen, and he is asking Michael and Matt if DT is promoting DTS 6.0.6. If you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's saying no LFE. <laughs> so so do, do you mind if I take this? Yeah, go ahead. So as I I can only say Marantz and Denon because those are our brands, but any of our surround pieces, if you have no subwoofer connected, you still get the dot one channel. Thank and to you. be clear, there is only one dot one channel and we went through with DTSX Pro, there was talk about having multiple channels but um, when we w when we had Glenn Stone on, he said there's not a recording available in the public space that has multiple LFE channels. So there's only one. Our AVRs will go, oh, no subwoofer, but you have large speakers. In fact, it won't give you a choice. It'll just go to large mm -hmm. and it will redirect the LFE channel into the speakers. So you will still get, absolutely still get, the dot one channel mm -hmm. it doesn't exactly. go away 
The only exactly. thing we're saying is not to connect the subwoofer output jack. That's a that's a great question, Gary, and good to see you back again. Mm -hmm. um, I I just uh, I want to make sure everybody understands it does not disappear. You're not throwing it away. At least with our AVRs, I can't speak to Sony or mm -hmm. or Yamaha or Ankyo or Pioneer or any of those, but I know with ours, we never lose the LFE channel. And I've done plenty of demos without external subs, just using mm -hmm. the bipolars. Mm -hmm. And nobody has ever complained about a lack of bass mm -hmm. during one of my demos. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not ever. Yeah. Okay. Now, there was a question that we, that we covered in the last session that we didn't get to hear, and it was the distance that you would put a BP-9000 tower um, um, in the wall, um, from the wall, considering it is a bipolar speaker. Do you want to talk about that? That's a great question. So when we voice the loudspeakers, uh, we always listen to them very far out into the room and very close to the wall. Jim <clears throat> shared a thing. Do you take the aluminum top off of, of let's say, your BP-9060, and you use it and create that distance. That's a real easy rule of thumb and it will sound really nice that far away. If you need to push the speaker back closer, um, uh, I've listened to the, like say the 9060s as close as like eight inches away from the back wall. And these will all couple differently to your space. It's gonna depend on your room, uh, but the forward focus bipolar array gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how close you can get it in your space. Always, as Michael says, it's up to your space and it's up to your taste. So listen to it and find out what works for you. I mean, it even goes for towing in and straight on. You know, I mean, we talked about this in the last session where, um, you know, um, Matt listens straight on, and there's a acoustic engineer uh, that works on uh, Polk products um, that's uh, that likes them towed in, right? So um, uh, it, just, it, get, it just goes to personal taste. With the BPs. If you fire them straight forward, you will get lots of the BP experience be very immersive. If you want more pinpoint imaging with BP, you tow them in a little bit and things will things will snap into place a little bit more. So that's again about your personal taste and the acoustics of your room. Now, one thing too that you could also point out is we talk about placement flexibility, the ability to live in your living room, the design. Um, so for example, a lot of times, depending on the distance from the wall also has an impact on the base. And most speakers, there's nothing you can do about that. So, so this with this speaker, because of the intelligent bass control, it, you have more um, ability to fine tune the bass depending on whether it's closer to the wall or further from the wall. So if it's a little too boomy, you can, you can just a, a quick turn of a knob and you can correct that. So that's another benefit to having the intelligent bass control built in and the powered subs built in is you can fine tune the bass based on where you have to place them. We'd like to thank Michael and Matt and, of course, Frederick, Jim, and Jen for helping um, with the presentation. Um, and hopefully you've learned a lot about the thought process that goes into a de um, definitive um, a speaker lineup, regardless of whether you're looking at floor standards, bookshelves, satellite speakers, or even a sound bar. Um, the, a lot of these uh, um, ideas when it comes to design and and how they operate and how they sound carries all the way across the brand. So for those who have to leave, take care and we will talk to you soon.